This story began with a not-so-happy dream that a girl had one day. This girl was dressed in a beautiful wedding dress and was walking down the aisle holding some kind of small casket. She said that she was a princess of the kingdom of Suyat, namely Gomerville Capet. Soon she came close to the throne on which some man was sitting and said in a trembling voice that she had come to become queen of the realm of the evening mist. But the man who sat on his throne touched his lips with an iron palm and laughed. He then turned to his aides, scoffing and asking what she was even saying. Next to this king was a beautiful girl who was dressed in a nightie, and as she looked at the lady who had arrived, she said that the lady said she wanted to be their queen. The other guests also began to laugh, for they thought her suggestion was as silly as possible. One of the courtiers asked, Perhaps she can only weave and sing like a nightingale, but they, the women of the realm of the evening gloom, can only dance and gallop. One of them asked with a sneer, how can they rely on her, this little girl from the South? She even has such a weak voice that it is impossible to hear anything she says. Someone said that she had even come to die, for in such light clothing she would freeze to death if thrown out of the palace. And as soon as the girl approached the king to fulfill her promise, he immediately grabbed her by the throat with his iron hand. He said that he was very surprised that a small country which is on the verge of extinction, dares to send a little princess and at the same time hopes that she will become his queen. To him it is just ridiculous and very stupid. The girl, who was breathing very heavily, for the man was restraining her with his hand, tried to say that they had been engaged for a long time after all, so it had to happen sometime. But he raised it still higher and said angrily that it was superfluous babble a verbal agreement between the dead man and them, for now the ruler of the realm of evening darkness, he marked the din. And he said with relish that the girl had come to this place as his property, his slave, his new toy. At that moment, one of the girls who were present there took the chains and blindfold and asked for the princess of the vanity kingdom to approach her. She pointed to the collar and said it was made specifically for her size. This brought tears to the poor bride's eyes, but she could not say a single word out of horror. At this point the others began to help fasten these iron shackles around the girl's neck. She tried to resist, and all the while she was screaming at them not to do it, for she would not be a slave. However, no one listened to her, of course. In the flurry of these rapes they even tore her beautiful necklace of expensive stones. Soon, when the chains were put around her neck, she cried and said that she did not want to sit on that chain, for she was a princess and had come to be a queen, not some slave. The king, who at this moment held the chain and controlled every movement of this girl, said that not at all, she was not worthy to be his queen. He also added that the girl has only one choice, to become a new favorite among his many mistresses, she has no other choice. The girl tried to resist, but she was unable to do so. The king, in turn, said that she might not have known, but before her arrival, the Reuben family and the Manzanita Palace had also sent so-called princesses. He pointed towards the girls who sat next to his throne and replied for her to look. After all, they were many times more intelligent than she was, and none of them even dared to say that they had come to take the throne. The poor girl didn't know what was going on. She thought that everyone there was crazy and mad, and that the king, whom her father and brother had forced her to marry, was a real psychopath. In fact, before what you're about to learn about happened, one girl had a rather strange and even scary dream about a wedding two nights in a row. And each time, with horror waking up in the middle of the night, she had no idea that this was fate's way of warning her of the coming events, and that was, until in reality she experienced something similar to what happened to the princess from her dream. Two years ago her father passed away, and the family property was divided in half. Half went to the girl herself, and the other half to her stepmother and stepsister. So two years later she was to marry her boyfriend, whom she had been dating for five years. However, on the day of the wedding it turned out that he was having a rather stormy affair with her half-sister. They planned it for two whole years so she would get her license and then, after the wedding, 
eliminate just her by making an accident. After there were no obstacles, they would steal some of the girls' possessions and also receive the insurance payments they had taken care to arrange in advance. It was because of her naivety that the girl thought all this time that her stepmother and stepsister were treating her normally and that they had no complaints or grievances. She actually thought that she and her fiancé had really fallen for each other at first sight and that they would be able to spend the rest of their lives together, soul to soul. But it turned out that only one girl thought so. The others had their own plans for her. And the day she came and caught her half-sister with her fiancé, the girl was very angry. But that sweet couple realized that she in no way cannot tell anyone this truth. So they began to take serious measures to eliminate her right at that moment. And now, as she flew down from the terrace of the house, she thought about the fact that there was no way she was going to accept it, because she couldn't just die on the day that was supposed to be the happiest day of her life. When it was over, the girl had only darkness in front of her eyes for a while. However, after that she began to wake up and was coughing violently because of the impact with the floor. As soon as she opened her eyes, she realized that she was alive and could breathe. The girl was very happy about it, but she did not really know what fate awaited her in the future. If she had known, she would not have been so happy. In fact, she didn't immediately realize that her soul had moved into another body. She felt like her head was about to explode from the strange scrawled images mixed with memories of her past. Soon, a beautiful lady came into the girl's room holding a candle. She said that she had already wanted to call someone to dump the body, and she was apparently alive. The girl sighed testily and said that their princess had such a hard life. The girl was breathing hard, for she had a chain around her neck, and said she did not want to die on this day or on her wedding day. Then she asked the stranger more closely and found out who she was. The woman came closer with a slow but confident step and, smiling, said she was the ruler's favorite and her name was Liv. The bride was very surprised and asked who she was even talking about. Liv looked at her majestically and said that of course she was referring to their master, Othella Eudis. The bride wondered if the girl had lost all her last brains because she had lost her vitality at some point. Then she wondered in surprise why she was looking at her with such a grimace in the first place. The bride thought that the woman in front of her was actually very beautiful, so much so that it made her feel sick. At that moment, Liv came closer, because the girl was really annoying her. She slapped her on the cheek with all her strength, so that she even fell to the floor, saying she was an abomination. And the bride felt a severe pain in her head at this moment. She had no way of knowing what time she had been lying in this dungeon in the first place, and why she had a chain around her neck in the first place. The girl suddenly remembered that this looked a lot like the nightmare she'd had two nights in a row. At that moment, the villainous woman put the candles on the table and began to take something out of her cleavage. It was a small jar. Liv said, smiling all the time, that she wouldn't live to see the morning. She grabbed her by the hair and started pouring the girl's contents directly into her mouth. Liv said that it so happened that His Majesty had arranged a game in the garden that evening. And she, a beautiful woman with a good heart, wanted her to have the unforgettable experience that all newlyweds have. The girl at this point began to gasp, for she was pouring in the contents of the bottle too quickly. At this time, she was also trying to understand which game was in question, and which newlyweds, and what was the impression at all. Liv, when she had finally poured out the entire contents of the bottle, stepped away from the girl, at which point, a rather statuesque man suddenly appeared behind them. He turned to her at once, peering behind the screen. The woman immediately hid the bottle back into her cleavage, and turning to his majesty, said that it was the foolish woman who had soiled her dress, and indeed a small stain could be seen on her dress. The bride, who was fighting hard for her life, started screaming, asking this crazy woman what she had even given her, and she only mockingly asked if she was still alive. The two of them were about to leave, but suddenly Othello stopped and stared at his bride. Liv, pouring oil on the fire, 
told His Majesty that the horny princess was still thinking about her wedding night with him. When the man heard this, his eyes showed all the anger he felt and called her a courtesan. When the bride heard this, she became even more angry. She tried again to take off her chains, but of course she could not. Then she simply called the king an idiot, for she was very much hurt by his words. He was about to answer her, but suddenly a servant ran into the room and addressed his majesty. He said that Lawrence demanded a report on the war effort, but the king was very angry, so he asked to be sent away. And he himself at this moment took the girl's chain, lifting it upward. He called her all sorts of curses and then started pulling her chain to follow him. Othello sighed heavily and said that so much of his doggy was doing him good anyway. So as long as he had him, he had a very easy life. And thanks to him, he could have the longest coastline on the north side of the continent. He led the girl farther and farther toward the exit. The bride herself was thinking about Laundress. The name was so familiar to her, but she could not understand where it came from. The king turned to her and told her that she was the illegitimate daughter of the king of a small country, living off the farmers of its specialized trade, not even eligible for the throne. And he doesn't understand how she even dares to want to be his queen. She's too arrogant and overconfident to do such a thing. By then they had gone outside, and the girl stood aghast as she watched it all. For there were many different young men who were completely naked, and some were also on chains. Most of them had various masks. The king moved closer to her and asked that she watch, for it was her place, and inquired if she liked it, for his garden was home to many energetic beasts and slaves, all like her. The girl was so surprised by all that was happening that she could not answer a word. He then shoved her into the crowd and told her to choose the one she liked best and spend her unforgettable wedding night. She had no choice but to go down the stairs to the crowd. She was actually very scared, for she did not know what awaited her, but she had no choice. As soon as people saw her, and especially men, they happily started saying that this girl is from Suyat, and her skin looks very even delicate. Many people immediately started reaching their hands to her body to taste her skin, because it was so shiny. Others grabbed her by the dress to pull her closer to them and said they wanted to lick her feet. The girl shook them off and slapped their hands, telling them to go away and not to touch her. Tears were streaming down her eyes, but the men kept coming and coming. She couldn't help it. Soon the girl still managed to get away from them. She ran off somewhere to the side and walked past the garden, thinking about how ridiculous this was. She had no way of knowing why she was in such an absurd place after her death, but she began to recall that she thought she had seen this scene in her nightmare. But she was not so sure anymore, for the girl was very fond of reading various books and assumed that she could have seen the story there as well. She walked farther and farther away from those wild animals who wanted to eat her alive, and then suddenly she didn't notice a small rock, so she clung to it. The girl couldn't keep her balance, so she fell straight to the ground in her snow-white dress. She felt pain, but when she looked away to get up, she saw someone's silhouette not far from her. He was standing by the fountain, apparently wiping up some blood. Many wounds were visible on his body, and it was not clear whose blood it was, whether it was someone else's or his own. For a while the girl just stood there looking at him, she was crying hard and straight up begging for help. She wanted someone to save her. The man, hearing someone's voice, immediately turned around to see who it was. He had a mask with two horns on his face, and his torso was naked. He held a towel in his hands to wipe his wet body, which was quite pumped up. At this very time, the king had already managed to return to his apartments and was lying on a huge bed. The king had already returned to his apartment and was lying on a huge bed. Liv, who was as close to his majesty as possible, turned and offered to play a game, and inquired how many beasts she could be eaten by that evening. She laughed and said that she wanted it herself after all, so there should be no complaints. Othello, who was enjoying the whole picture, smiled and said that it was a pity. After all, he wanted to marry a Suyat girl, but he had no idea that their princess was a narcissist, and the marriage would be a disgrace to their entire nation. He winked at the girl and said that he proposed to execute her at dawn, 
so that she would no longer loom before their eyes. Liv moved closer to him and put her finger to his lips, running it gently over them. She also told His Majesty that he was too impatient, after all. The dowry from Suyat hadn't arrived yet, and the princess was quite beautiful. How could he do such an unkind thing? Atello smiled, greedily devouring her with his gaze, and said that he actually preferred women who entangled him like a snake, such as she. At that moment, the image of the girl trying to break free of the chain popped into his mind, and he said that in addition, she had lost interest in everything. Goomerville at this point continued to lie on the floor and did not get up. She mentally asked for help. Her legs had become very weak by this time, apparently because of the medication the girl had given her, and she couldn't even stand up. In fact, she was burning up. Her body went slack, and as if her eyes were hazy, she concluded to herself that it was definitely the liquid Liv had given her, for there was no other explanation. The girl could not understand what she had done to her, and she was even frightened, thinking that she might die again because of it. She looked up and saw that there was another slave standing in the fountain. She hadn't noticed him before, or she just hadn't given it much thought. Goomerville took a closer look and noticed that he was also wearing a mask. In fact, he didn't look like the others. He was motionless and his gaze was quite calm. Many scars and the smell of blood could also be seen on this man's body. But she didn't understand why that was. At this very time, several people came from behind who had been following the girl all this time. One of them was very surprised at how fast she could run to the fountain in such a short period of time. They started to get closer to finally have some fun with the girl, but then suddenly they saw the huge man who had been standing still all this time turn around and they saw that he was holding an ominous sword. The people were immediately frightened. They began to run away, shouting that this man was not a slave, but a nobleman who had somehow managed to get in. They were very frightened, because they realized that he could kill them very quickly. So they started running away and the man at that moment also started coming out of the fountain and splashing water in all directions. The girl realized that it was very dangerous to do anything now. He was coming closer and closer to her. She looked him in the face and asked him in a pitiful voice to stay away, because he smelled of blood, and that frightened her. The stranger stopped right in front of Goomerville, and in a voice muffled because of the mask, asked, Is she on some kind of drug? The girl, in turn, replied in a trembling voice that she was a suet princess and asked that he not defile her body. The stranger crouched beside her at that moment and took her by the shoulder. The man slowly said the name of her city, and after that he replied that in fact Othella despised the support from Suyat and she would certainly not become queen. He would spoil her so that there would be a reason, shall we say, to bring her back. Goomerville looked him straight in the eye as the man lifted her up and thought his golden gaze was blinding her. The stranger took her in his arms, and looking her straight in the eyes, told her that if she was loved by her family, someone would surely be sent for her. If not, then life would be full of sadness. He was silent for a while. Then he asked whether to let her go or take her back. The choice was hers alone. Gummerville was shivering with fear and cold. She did not know what to do, but she knew that she could not stay alone. So, with tears in her eyes, she asked him to take her away. Then he asked in a quiet voice what her name was. The girl immediately said her name, and then he asked if she wanted anything that night. Goomerville was silent for a while, and after that she said that she was a princess, but she wanted to be a queen, but not some kind of slave for sure. At that moment she realized what she'd said and thought she must have a fever. If she was saying such stupid things to a stranger, but she felt some will, and so she continued to speak. The girl said that she was a bride and did not want to be deceived, did not want to be abandoned. At that moment, he suddenly put her down again and asked that the girl wait for a while. At that moment, he stepped aside. After that, he took his sword, which had been left there. He turned around and stared at it for a while. And after that, the stranger turned sharply toward Goomerville and a loud whistle sounded. It meant that her shackles had been broken, and she was free at last. The man stood in front of her and threw her in chains into the fountain. He replied that everything would be as she wished it to be. 
Soon they finally arrived at the manor. The man brought her into the room and sat down beside her on the bed. She felt very sick and thirsty. She was hot and cold at the same time. Goomerville did not understand what was happening. The whole time he was carrying her to her room, she was falling asleep and waking up, and she didn't even notice that she was already in the castle. The man explained that it was perfectly normal, since she was on drugs now. And then, in a more hateful voice, he replied that Liv's shenanigans were getting nastier every time. She was still crying and breathing hard. She was very hot. The girl asked if she was feeling so strange now because of some drug. He, getting out of bed to leave the girl alone, said that was right. It was the drug. Then suddenly she grabbed his arm and looked at him with a pitiful look and asked if she could look at his face. He replied that she could do it. Then Gummerville immediately reached for his mask and slowly began to remove it, for she was still too weak. Soon his face appeared from under the black mask of some animal. She thought he was an incredibly beautiful man. As she exhaled heavily, and thanked the heavens that she could die without regret on her horrible wedding night. Shortly thereafter, the man made his way outside and met up with his friend there, who was just waiting for him. His friend ran up to the man and said that he was very afraid, that he had ruined everything for him. But they had to go now. The wild orcs had raided their barracks in Valin. He also said that the attack has not stopped in any way and will definitely not end any time soon. However, they no longer had any military funds left. He also asked if there were any results and when his majesty would give them money to maintain the army. The man was already fully dressed in his military uniform and his friend helped throw his cloak over his shoulders. He said that the king was avoiding meeting him. He wanted to sneak into the harem and even hid his face. She wanted to add something else, but his aide interrupted and said he shouldn't have done that because he could have been caught and exposed. But the man said they have a very suspicious and crazy king, and he's also very stingy, so you can't risk it. When the man heard this, he turned to his friend, and he immediately realized his mistake. He laughed nervously and said that he would not say such things again, he would watch his words. They went on somewhere else, and the man said he wanted to take one more woman with him. Jay was very surprised when he heard this and asked if the master had taken a fancy to Othello's slave girl or some kind of dancer. But whoever she was, it was still strange to him. His assistant was outraged and said that not only could he not take her away, he wasn't even allowed to say he had touched her or she would be executed immediately. He at this point had already started screaming and asked that the Lord not forget that Othella had his weak spot in his hands. He was tired of hearing all this, so he answered that he understood, and said that he could stop, because he just wanted to take care of things as soon as possible, and in a few days they would have to go back. Jay smiled smugly and said that the slave girl must be very pretty, since she was able to make his master's iron heart grow fierce. He didn't like that, and he blurted out, telling the guy to shut up already, because he was too embarrassed by those words. At this time, Goomerville, who was still lying in bed and gaining strength, was already awake, for the sun was shining directly into her room. She was still trying to digest the information that was in the book, and after the absurdity that had gone on before her, it finally, finally, finally dawned on her that there was no turning back. She started going over the various names of cities in her head, such as the Kingdom of Evening Mist and Suyata. The girl tried for quite some time to remember where she had heard those names, and before long, she finally remembered that she had read one novel and was transported into his world. It's a dystopian biographical novel called Lounds the Great. This book is so unpopular that she couldn't even find it to let anyone know about it at all, and there wasn't even any information about it on the internet at all. It seemed to her at that moment that she was the only one in the world who could read this novel. In the end, because of what happened, she became the princess of the kingdom of Suyat. After a while, she did manage to comprehend the situation a bit, thanks to getting at least some of the girl's memories. She finally got out of bed and walked over to the mirror and hesitantly said her name, trying to get used to her new appearance. In fact, Goomerville is a passable character her tragic life only mentioned in passing in the book. As an illegitimate daughter, 
she was named Princess and sent by her father and brother to the Kingdom of Evening Mist, the most powerful nation on the continent at the time, to be married. But the king of the evening gloom, a man named Othella, hated the weakening Suyat. That is why he despised and humiliated this princess. And just like that, the princess, who was in the dawn of her prime, was branded as extravagant and promiscuous. And her husband did not treat her properly, and a few months after her wedding she was beheaded. In fact, the motherland Suyat, and even the indifferent blood relatives, not only did not avenge her injustice, but also began to spread a rumor about her that she had self-humiliated herself before marriage, because of which she was cursed for a long time after her death. And only one character in this book, Lawrence, overthrew a tyrant and united the northern continent. It wasn't until years later, when the evening mist cannon was changed, that Princess Goomerville's character was finally honored. But now the girl doesn't understand the point of clearing her name after death. She needs to live for revenge. She will beat the rot out of those idiots and heartless people who let themselves do all this. And henceforth, Gummerville told herself that she would in no way submit to any villain, would live honorably for her own sake. She moved closer to the mirror and noticed that her eyes seemed to have just lit up. It was probably just her imagination, but they were actually incredibly beautiful. But that's not surprising since she's royalty. Then she suddenly noticed some red marks on her neck and assumed they were most likely due to the shackles she was wearing. But then suddenly, the girl remembered that last night some man had carried her out of the garden to play. She immediately felt uncomfortable. Her face flushed, and she couldn't remember who he was. The drug had weakened her mind, and she couldn't even ask his name. For a while she tried to remember, at least what he looked like. But even that she couldn't. Goomerville suggested that he is most likely also a slave of some sort. But even if he is a slave, he is definitely stronger than Othello. After all, a slave with a sword is quite rare. At that moment, she caught herself thinking that she wouldn't mind seeing him again. At this very time, the man, along with his assistant Jay, were on the battlefield in their homeland. The man professionally wielded his sword and killed all the monsters, and his assistant was actually even terrified because he did not understand why there were so many of these monsters. His commander explained that it was because there were too few of them. It would be easy to deal with them if there were at least five of them. Jay was getting desperate by now. He said that all the money for the army has been spent, so the army of nobles went on strike and left. They will only have to rely on their troop, and he doesn't know when they can finish it all. He said, after killing another monster, that maybe it would be better for them to back off altogether. After all, he didn't understand why they had to work so hard for this thief of a noodle. But his commander disagreed with the guy and said they weren't doing it for him, but for their people. Jay, hearing this, said that, in principle, this was also true. After all, if the defense line surrendered, the border towns would immediately be destroyed, and his mother would be ashamed of him for not being able to defend even his own country. The commander then said that it would be really nice to find some money. The boy agreed and said that it would be very nice if they found some treasure. At this time, a number of people were gathered near the castle where Gummerville was. They were two young ladies and the maids who accompanied them. One of the guests asked if they were sure that the princess was in the snow castle. One of those girls was Liv, and her friend had said that there was definitely no way a girl could escape from the palace. And this was the only place they hadn't looked yet. Then the girl turned to the maids and told them to go and find her. But the maids were immediately frightened. One of them said that some people say that there are even ghosts there, and she did not want to go there. At this time, Goomerville was standing near the mirror, looking at the torn dress she had worn last night. She did not know what to do or what to wear now, but suddenly she heard a strange sound behind her. And at the same second, two maids burst into her room, one of them at the sight of the girl immediately angrily said that she would go with them. Goomerville could not understand a thing. They had come up to her so quickly and taken her by the hand to take her somewhere. She couldn't even resist it. The girl started to break free and asked who they were and asked them to let her go. But soon the women took her out into the yard and just threw her on the ground. When they did, 
Liv came up to the girl and said in an arrogant voice that their Princess Goomerville had arrived. With the nickname Absurd, she also said that she was very embarrassed for her because she was so disheveled and unkempt. The girl, who couldn't even look at her, for she realized who it was by her voice, concluded for herself that things were very bad for her, for in the book Goomerville was killed after being branded with many accusations. But, in fact, she couldn't even think that everything would happen so quickly. Then the girl remembered the man's words last night. He had said that the king would spoil her so that there would be a reason to bring her back. She concluded for herself that that unknown man was indeed telling the truth, for now the king was making every move to carry out this plan. At this time, Othello was sitting, as always, in his beautiful castle, on his huge throne. Several people came to see him. In fact, it was Liv who brought the girl to him. He scrutinized her with his gaze and asked, who did our dear princess sleep with last night after all? At that moment, the people who were standing on the sides, mostly men, started shouting out that she was with them. There were quite a few of them, and each one was trying to prove that she was with him. Goomerville glimpsed at them and realized they were trying to talk down on her from earlier. Then suddenly Othello spoke. He smiled evilly and said that the princess must have been very happy last night and satisfied all her needs. Then the girl plucked up her courage. She said sternly that not at all, for it was not them, but she would not admit who it really was. Goomerville thought about the fact that she had gone crazy last night and couldn't even remember the man's face, but she clearly remembered that he had scars all over his body, and he was definitely not one of those who had been brought up to testify. Liv spoke up at that moment and looked at the girl, saying that she certainly had a lot of nerve and mockingly called her a princess. Goomerville replied confidently that she was a princess and was entitled to it. She had indeed slept with someone last night, but certainly not the people currently present in this room. The king then began to watch the girl intently and asked who the lucky man happened to be. Goomerville said in a calm voice that she was with her and pointed a finger at the girl who was standing next to her. The girl thought to herself at that moment, that she was going to die anyway, so she could do crazy things, at least have a little fun. When the body heard this, it started laughing loudly and couldn't even stop for a few minutes. After a while, he called her a crazy girl, and Liv, who was standing next to her, started shoving her, saying she wasn't normal at all, and why she was making things up. At that moment, he became very serious and asked the girl to stop and not to do it. He said that he was used to meeting someone who would dare to say something stupid in front of him. Goomerville looked at him and said it wasn't nonsense at all. They all said they had slept with her, but they had no proof of it, and she said she had slept with the girl, and the proof was on her hands, her bite marks. In fact, the girl bit everyone's hands, both the maids and Liv herself, when they tried to take her out of the castle. Liv turned indignantly to his majesty and said that the woman had bitten her when she resisted the order. Othello turned to Goomerville and said that in any case she had confessed herself that she had been defiled on her wedding night, and such vile women were not allowed in his harem. So he asked that she write a letter to her country and ask them to send gifts to apologize and take her back. He also said that the girl would live in the dungeon until she was taken from there. Goomerville was very surprised to hear this. She hadn't really expected it, because the book didn't say anything about it. In fact, she could imagine how horrible the conditions were there. Lots of rats and various maggots. And if you got one over there, you could kiss your health goodbye. The book had said that the heroine's body orders were festering and stinking, and now the girl realized what the real cause of it all was. Goomerville's character is pretty weak, so she probably just submitted to it all. But the girl is newly reborn and doesn't want to just die like that. She may be from L.A., but she needs to save her own skin. She even fell to the floor in surprise. Then she looked at the king and said that she did not know where she had made the mistake. However, the kingdom promises to send a huge dowry with her, and if they found out that she had been put in the dungeon, they would turn around and take whatever was next. She looked very sorry, but in her head she was very happy because he wouldn't get any money if he treated her terribly. How, at least for a while, 
she could secure her freedom and then escape. Goomerville addressed his majesty in an affectionate voice and said that she did not expect to remain in his harem and asked to be made at least a maid to atone for her sins. Liv at this point began to creep up on his majesty and said that since the princess was so genuinely remorseful, why not set her up? Soon the girl was given a special uniform and supplies, and she immediately went to practice what she wanted to do. She was glad that at least they didn't execute her right away, and she wasn't frozen in the dungeon, so she had a much better chance of survival. She was quite satisfied with being a harem servant, because there was no other choice. When the girl sat scrubbing the floors as usual, she felt cold water pouring down on her from behind. Turning back, she saw the other maids. One of them laughed happily as she held the empty bucket in her hands and replied that she was now at the very bottom. The other one supported her and said that if she shouted the name of the lady once more, she could not even expect a happy life, because a princess of such a small country like Suyat could only be a servant. After that, they giggled and started to go on about their business, leaving the girl alone. Goomerville got very angry about this. She started to wipe the water off her face and thought about the fact that she had promised that she would retaliate immediately. However, she didn't have that opportunity right now, and that made her sad. But then, suddenly, the maids, when they were about to go outside, slipped and fell, hitting their heads. One of them started screaming, asking why it was so slippery. Was the girl so inept that she even spilled water? Gumerville made an innocent look and said she actually used soapy water and asked if that wouldn't make the floors cleaner. The maids in one voice began to shout, asking who could leave such a thick layer of soap. And the girl calmly replied that she was a princess after all. She had never been engaged in cleaning, so she did not understand, and also asked sincerely for forgiveness. The girl apologized at that moment, telling herself that there wasn't a single person in this palace that she liked. So they deserved to fall like this. But then suddenly, she remembered a few nights ago she'd spent with a man whose body was all scarred, and realized she didn't like anyone but him. Gomerville straight up started crying because she felt sorry for him, because he was so gentle. But she doesn't know his identity. She doesn't know where he is. She doesn't even know if he's an enemy or a friend. At this very time in the military town, things were not as quiet as they could have been. The man whom the poor girl had been thinking of as she cleaned the lock was lying almost unconscious. He was very ill. His assistant, Jay, immediately became worried and said that he had been poisoned. Apparently the monster started thinking with their heads, so they decided to smear their weapons with poison. The man got angry about all his chatter and asked him to shut up already, and wondered if he would even prepare an antidote for him. The lad said cheerfully that of course he would cook everything, and he asked that he should hurry up, for if others were poisoned, they should be helped too. Jay explained the poison. Yes, we're from the leaves. The ingredients are simple enough for him, but a man will lie in bed for at least three days before he can finally get up. When he heard this, he was upset, and said that it was very well, for he wanted to return in three days, and he must not, on any account, break the word he had given to the girl. Jay, hearing this, smiled happily and asked, Has he really made an appointment with his sweetheart? But the man sternly replied that he had no such experience at all, certainly not, and if he had known at once, he would have told her. He's just afraid her position is too precarious and she might not make it. As Jay began to treat the man's cuts, the man said he had an errand for the guy. The man immediately replied that of course he would fulfill everything, and the man asked him to turn into an owl. After all, it would be much easier, and flew to the palace and helped to make sure that the girl was safe. He also tied his letter to his paw and asked that he give her this to her by all means. Soon, Jay, in his owl form, finally did fly to the castle and sat on one of the branches that was closest to the exit and watched the whole thing. And at that moment, one of the maids approached the girl and said that in this place, not only the corridors but even the stairs should shine. Liv pretended to be very surprised, and said that some people talk about the snow palace being haunted, and those stairs never even end. The woman ordered that Goomerville go there and scrub that staircase for the rest of her life and never come across it again. Jay, who was watching all this, realized that she must be the girl, 
the Lord's favorite. Then he decided to get revenge on this mistress who was bullying poor Gummerville, and scratched her right on the head with his paws, ruffling all her hair. And after that, the smug one began to fly away somewhere in the forest, and the girl screamed with fear and waved her hands to ward off this bird, which had not been over her head for a long time. At this time, the lad flew to a tree, and sitting on a branch, opened that note which the gentleman had handed over. There was a message written to Gummerville. The man said he missed the stars they had looked up to that very night. He quickly slammed down this note and realized that this was indeed a dangerous woman, for a cold-blooded and grim draconess of the Lounds Empire to be able to write something like this. Jay couldn't see her face, but he could tell from her voice that she was very confused, and she looked like there was nothing special about this girl. But he realized one thing. This girl had clogged up all of the master's thoughts with herself, and Liv was somehow trying to intimidate her. This was an unusual maid, after all. The boy mentally apologized to the Lord, thinking that her presence might be too dangerous. So he simply tore up the note. At that time, Goomerville was able to arrive at the palace where the man had hidden her. She looked at the size of the palace and realized that it was the Snow Palace after all. Behind her stood two ladies who were dressed in beautiful and expensive dresses. The girl turned around and asked if they would not watch her work. But the girl said not at all. There are often ghosts there, and if you go in, you don't know if you'll ever come out. So they decided to wait outside with the maid. Goomerville was very surprised when she heard that there might be ghosts there. After all, on the night she had been with the man, everything had been perfectly normal and no one had been seen. For a while the girl stood and just watched, and then she went to the doors. And when she opened them, she saw many different branches with thorns, which were blocking her way. The two ladies who were supposed to be watching her moved farther away, for they were very afraid. And one of them shouted for her to come in soon, for they did not want to wait here too long. Goomerville, picking her way through those branches, thought that her memory must have probably been blown away, for she had absolutely no memory of it all. The girl realized that it was entirely possible, for there could have been hallucinations as a side effect of Liv's medication. Once the girl made her way inside, she saw one of the abandoned rooms. Looking around at the interior, she realized that nobles used to live in this place. She rolled up her sleeve so they wouldn't get in her way, she wouldn't get dirty, and realized that not only was everything old, it looked like there had been a serious fire in the place. Goomerville immediately picked up her special appliance and began dusting the walls, and when she thought of the fire, it reminded her of Lowndes. The girl then immediately remembered that she was now in the book, Lounds, the great protagonist of which is this very man. He is the cousin of the mad ruler Othellus, and also the son of Caesar, the brother of the previous king. And on the death of the old king, Eutia from illness, according to his wishes and the royal court, Caesar, his own brother since the dawn of Len, was to be first in line to succeed to the throne. But there was Bella the wife of the old Uti. She was a woman ambitious and ruthless. To put her son on the throne, she even had to put a lot of effort into it. She wanted her son to have the throne so badly that she even set fire to Caesar's family's castle. Perhaps it was karma that after the fire, Bella's son fell from his horse and died before he could take the throne. Bella eventually became queen herself and ruled for over a decade, implementing ironclad policies that strengthened the realm of the evening mist. And on her deathbed, she passed her throne to Othel's only grandson. But legend has it that Othel, as a man, died at an early age. He saw his grandmother set on fire and saw his father here writhing in agony for ten days after he fell from his horse. There are also some rumors that he was born with a damaged hand. This is why he was eccentric, misbehaved, and even became a tyrant in the end. In addition, Lowndes, who grew up, inherited his father's domain. Perhaps to avenge his parents' deaths, he organized and trained his own obsidian army. It all started with him helping Othello and blazing new trails, pacifying the frontier. And suddenly, one day, he organized just men and serfs to overthrow Othello. And he took his place on the throne. In fact, according to the book, that idiot Othello gets his in the end. But before he does, he kills poor Gummerville. 
and even though he didn't go to see her as queen, but he never found another to take her place, no woman married him in a formal ceremony. That's why the history books wrote her as his queen. The girl continued to scrub every corner of this estate and thought about the fact that the book said that on the second day after her execution, Lowndes started a crusade. Then the girl suddenly guessed that he must have loved her, but then she pushed the thought away quickly, thinking that it could not be. For judging from Goomerville's recollections, she was not even acquainted with any Lowndes. Soon she was finally able to clean up the whole place near the fireplace, and, inspecting her work, was very pleased. And then the girl realized that apparently she would never have a chance to cross paths with this hero. At this time in the warrior camp, a loud shout was heard from one of the tents where the Lord was sitting. Lowndes was still very weak, but he was able to sit up. He was about to go somewhere, when suddenly one of the knights came running into his tent and spoke to him very excitedly. The man worriedly said that Jay had told them he couldn't move and needed to rest for three days, and now it had only been a day and a half. But the man said it wasn't necessary, so he asked the servant to get everyone together. After all, they were going to the capital and asked how many giants they had already managed to destroy. The knight reported that as many as eleven giants had been destroyed. One was even caught alive. Lowndes asked him to gather them all in one place. The man asked in surprise if they were already retreating, but the gentleman replied that not at all, they were going to get the money they so badly needed. At that moment, the girl, who continued to clean the manor, heard some strange sound. It had been repeated several times already, and then suddenly she heard it even louder than before. Hammerville was very frightened. Then she looked in the direction where the smoke was coming from. She looked closer at the fireplace and realized it wasn't smoke. It was all the cinders that had gathered on it. And bending down, the girl saw a golden-covered book lying on the firewood. She was very surprised, for it had not been there before. She removed it from that place and, sitting down on the floor, opened it. After a glimpse, she realized that it was a book on magic, and remembered that spirits and mages were also present in this world. Gummerville remembered that in the book, it was written that only those with spirit blood flowing in them would find it very easy to master magic. But she wasn't sure how one could figure out who had this so-called spirit blood flowing in them. At that time, Othello, who was sitting on his throne, received a visitor. It was a knight who brought some fetters and threw them right in front of him. After examining them closely, the king said that they had apparently been cut up and by a rather heavy weapon. The knight bowed to him and said it was done with some sort of very sharp blade. They found them when they were draining the cleaning fountain. He said in a trembling voice that most likely it was even done with a single blow. Othello started to rise from his throne and said that someone dared to sneak a custom-made blade into his garden and even remove the shackles from someone. This is too dangerous. The knight was immediately afraid that something was about to be done to him. However, he kept his head down and replied loudly that he had made a mistake and apologized for it, saying that it would not happen again. Othello at this point took a piece of cut shackles and said slowly that he had indeed neglected his duties. Then he fairly turned to the other servants and ordered that he be taken downstairs and his hands be cut off. The man was very frightened. He immediately began to shout and ask his majesty to have mercy on him. After all, he would not repeat such blunders and mistakes again, but he didn't have time to finish. For at that moment his hands were being cut off, and Otello asked who had dared to take his new pet, who it was that interested him most at the moment. Some time later one of the butlers came to him and, addressing his majesty, said that they reported that Lowndes had returned to the capital with a small team. When Othello heard this, he was very surprised and said that as far as he could remember, he was coming back the other day. Butler confirmed this information, but said he had returned four days ago to report the situation, but had been turned away. When the king heard this, he was very surprised and asked what it meant to report since he had only come because of the war expenses. The man explained that there were indeed not enough supplies on the front lines, and the Noble Alliance army was currently recovering, when he was about to say about the other army, but the man interrupted him. 
Othello said in a stern voice that the Obsidian army belonged to Lounds, not him, so he absolutely didn't care about it. Then, after thinking for a while, he said that he also had used blood flowing in him, and he was older than him in rank and had more military honors than him. He went up to the butler and said that even after all this, they still obeyed him. And looking sternly at his servant, he asked if he was going to swear allegiance to him too, so that he could sit on two chairs at the same time. The man became very worried and said in a trembling voice that not at all, for they would always be loyal to his majesty. Othello forever and ever. The other men who were also present knelt down and began to worship their greatest, in their opinion, king. But Othello, seeing and hearing all this, only started laughing loudly without stopping. When he finally calmed down, he asked if the guy had really gone back four days ago. One of the servants immediately said that it was absolutely true. Goomerville was still studying the book at this moment. She thought of spirit blood and realized that she kind of recalled something like that. And the book itself said that there were two races of spirits on the continent. One is a white nobleman, and the other is a scattered Chacha tribe from the northwestern border towns. And Lowndes was only able to take the throne with the help of these very spirits. Unfortunately, the girl thought, she didn't seem to be affiliated with any of the spirit clans. Otherwise, she could practice and learn teleportation, or she could turn into a butterfly and just run away from this horrible place. Goomerville started to close the book and thought about the fact that she was a graduate student, so it was easy to memorize everything. She decided to study one of the spells more closely and try it out. The girl rose to her feet and, holding a book in her hands, began to pronounce various unfamiliar words in an incomprehensible language. And after that, she pointed towards the fireplace and said with a very loud, teleportation. However, of course nothing happened. She stayed in that spot, just like that. The book said that if a person with magic memorized this spell, they could move. Since the girl hadn't made any special hopes for it, she wasn't upset when it really didn't work out. So she slammed the book shut. At that moment, she heard someone screams under the window. It was, of course, the girls who were watching her work. One of them asked her to come out now, for His Majesty wanted to see her. Goomerville was very surprised at this. She decided to put the book back in the fireplace so that no one would suspect anything, and was about to go outside to come to the king. But at that moment she turned somewhere to the side, for again she heard some strange and incomprehensible sound. Because the girl was so engrossed, she didn't notice how the candlestick that had just been on the mantel began to fall and hit her head. She lost her bearings for a while and began to feel very dizzy, but then she looked at the spot where the candlestick should have been and assumed that the teleportation must have been successful after all. Soon she went to the castle and met up with Othello. They walked through the manor and just kept quiet. Goomerville thought about the fact that this man in the book had given the order for her to be beheaded, so she would definitely need to be as careful with him as possible. At that moment, he suddenly ran his iron hand over her neck and asked where the collar he had given her was. The girl shuddered at the touch of the cold iron, but she quickly brushed his hand away and asked him what kind of collar he was talking about. Not a gift, but a real instrument of torture. But Othello wasn't too embarrassed by the way she called it, and he then changed his question, asking where this instrument of torture was, and asked that she not lie to him, because she certainly couldn't have pulled it off herself. But the girl replied that she didn't really know either, because she had lost consciousness, and when she woke up, she was already without him. Othello, of course, did not believe her. He said that straightway it made her disappear for the night, so also it was something that spoiled what he had ordered. He also said that the head of the harem guards had been negligent in his duties, so he was severely punished for that. Then Othello said, with complete seriousness and even some pleasure, that he had cut off his hands. The girl, hearing this, was very surprised. She could not believe that he had really gone to such atrocities. He moved closer to the girl and touched her chin saying that her recklessness and arrogance when she first arrived had angered him greatly. After a few days of peace, however, he realizes that he doesn't hate her so much. 
Othello said that she had a chance to stay in the harem and become a candidate for queen. Gummerville, hearing this, was very surprised. However, she did not say a word. The girl thought about the fact that she was going to die anyway, and no one in her place would want to be a candidate, so she squeezed her dress and said she didn't need to do that. After all, she was fine with just being a servant. She laughed nervously and immediately started wiping the floor with whatever rag she could find first. She said it was a pretty good job and she liked it. The girl at this moment thought that when her soul merged with the memories, she felt the strong sense of self of the original heroine, the conviction that she wanted to fulfill her mission, namely, to get married. But she certainly shouldn't be hanging out with wolves, and even if she does become queen, it won't be with Atella. The man then laughed and asked if she was still unwilling. But suddenly, one of the servants came running in and addressed his majesty, saying that Lowndes had already arrived. The man said he could come in, and Goomerville was very surprised at that moment. She hadn't expected to see the main character so soon, but she immediately looked at the doors to see who he was. She couldn't see his face right away. The girl started at his feet. She noticed that his suit seemed to be woven out of pitch blackness, just as it had been described in the original novel. In fact, he is better known as a cold black dragon. Lowndes also possesses an aura of death that constantly emanates from him. When he entered the hall, he immediately bowed to the king as a sign of respect, even though he didn't really respect him. Othella, upon seeing him, didn't even say hello. He said that he had heard that he had been injured quite recently. His voice was not stinging in the slightest, but there were even notes of mockery. Goomerville, who hadn't looked at him until now, thought that it was very strange, for that scent of blood that was on his body seemed a little familiar to her, but she couldn't remember where she could smell it. The man, in turn, answered the king. He said not at all. Apparently someone had tricked him, or the rumors he had heard were not true. Othello smiled evilly at this point and said that apparently his information was wrong, but the lack of wounds was actually a very good thing. Goomerville at this point started bowing and stepping back. She thought about taking advantage of this beautiful moment and just walking away. But then suddenly, just as she was about to run out of the hall, Thela turned to her and told her to go to live. He also told her to ask her to prepare a table with wine for he wanted to have a drink with Lowndes, whom he had not seen for a long time. The man himself, hearing about the wine, was very wary, for he realized that it might not even end well. Othello at this point turned to his brother and asked if he could drink since he wasn't hurt. The man was silent for a while, pondering what he could answer and what the king's intentions were. But in a quiet voice, looking him straight in the eye, he said that he could, in principle. Soon the table was already prepared. On it stood a lot of different food and also wine, which the king had promised. Leave was rounding them, trying to make the atmosphere friendly and somehow seduce the king. When they finally sat down on opposite sides of the table, Othello raised his glass and said that he wanted to drink to his health. Lowndes, as etiquette dictated, also raised his glass and said that he would drink to his highness. Agumerville, who as soon as she had helped the girl had left at once, looked out from behind the curtain, for she was incredibly curious as to how things were going to go there. When she saw the man in black armor, she was all admiration, for it was the protagonist and child of destiny, Lowndes. She couldn't believe her eyes. In fact, according to the book, the man is supposed to be on good terms with Othello at this time, and this is because Othello's grandmother, Queen Bella, hid the very real truth about his parents' death from Lowndes. She told the boy that the fire in his house when he was a boy was only due to a magical mistake of his mother, St. Felicia. So Lowndes still didn't know Bella's real evil deeds or the true cause of his parents' deaths. On Othello is only concerned as to why the man refuses to relinquish his title and only recognizes the territory left to him by his father. Lowndes, for his part, wanders these territories, sheltering protectively from monsters. But what he's really looking for is his mother, Felicia, who has been reported missing. 
This eventually stabilized the country and also strengthened the obsidian army he had created. And now when the girl looks at him, you at first glance, it seems to her that they have a friendly, even relationship. But in reality, no one trusts each other there. The other maids and one of the ladies were also watching the whole thing. One of the maids said that she thought His Highness was much more handsome, but another said that Mr. Lowndes was also a very handsome man. A girl came up to her and asked her who she thought was prettier. At that moment, Gummerville thought that both of them had distinguished themselves by killing people, so in this case it was not beauty that was to be measured, but kindness. But in order not to be questioned, she simply replied that she didn't know much. They're just the same to her, that's all. Lowndes at this point heard them giggling and looked somewhere in the direction of Othello, who was watching all of this intently, suddenly turned to Goomerville and called out to her. The girl, who was just about to leave so that she would not be noticed, was very surprised. She couldn't understand why she was called, but she went straight to them. The king, who at this time was looking at his beloved Liv, smiling, asked if she could dance. The girl, who was very worried, replied that no, she doesn't know how to do that, and she has never even seen others dance, so she has no idea about it. The girl herself at that moment thought, not that she was considered a clown, since they wanted her to dance in front of everyone like some kind of doll and entertain the guests. But at that moment Liv grabbed her arm and pulled her straight to her, telling the princess not to be afraid or shy, because it wasn't as hard as she thought. Goomerville, the whole time, was stalling and trying to get away from it all. She kept denying it, saying she didn't know how to do anything, so she wasn't going anywhere. Well, the girl who enjoyed bullying the princess kept pulling her, for her to embarrass herself properly. Lowndes, who had heard some shouting nearby, immediately turned his attention in that direction. He did not understand what was going on, but he was interested. With one stroke, Liv shoved the girl into the hall after all and took off her beret. She introduced her as Princess Capes of the Kingdom of Suyat. The girl said mockingly that she had heard that the local women there were famous for their great singing. Lowndes glanced at them, looking very stern, as if he didn't like what was happening, or didn't like the fact that Goomerville had entered the room. The girl was very angry with Liv at that moment. She didn't understand why she was so indulgent and obeyed Othello's every order. Then suddenly the king looked at the girl and said that in that case, Goomerville should sing, and afterwards smiling, asked if she would refuse his request. The girl had no choice but to obey, for at that moment she even remembered how one of the garden guards had had his hands chopped off for distracting him from his tasks, and realized that she certainly didn't want to lose her hands. She was very nervous, but eventually she started to sing. Her voice was incredibly beautiful and filled the whole room with its bright sound. The moment she sang one of the songs, she was filled with outright joy. The girl didn't even notice anyone around her as she sang the words. Goomerville thought to herself that it was as if this was like a memory that had been imprinted in her mind, and she could really sing very well, if only she opened her mouth. Othello who had expected to hear terrible wars from the girl, was incredibly surprised when he heard how beautifully she could sing. Liv, who just wanted to pick on the poor girl, was very surprised, for she didn't know that Suyata women actually had a certain talent. Everyone was mesmerized by her beautiful voice, and Goomerville also enjoyed what she was doing, for in her past life she could not sing, but had always wanted to learn it. Lowndes had been watching the girl intently all this time, and a small smile even appeared on his face. In fact, her voice fascinated him, and he couldn't take his eyes off her. When the girl finished her song, the king suddenly rose from the table and turned to the man. He walked up to Goomerville and took her in his arms, saying that he had originally not wished to marry this Suyat woman, but he had suddenly changed his mind and wanted to keep this nightingale in his harem. The girl, hearing this, was incredibly surprised. She hadn't expected that he could do that at all, and she didn't know what kind of game he was playing, 